So as you can see, the, uh, the title for my talk today is Five Scriptures That Validate the Heartland Model for the Location of the Book of Mormon. And technically, as you'll see, a more accurate title would be Five Groups of Scriptures uh, That Validate the Heartland Model, but I simply shortened it for brevity's sake. For those of you who have heard me speak before, you know that my thrust or the main thrust of my work is to create a template of what the Nephite culture and religious rites and practices would have looked like anciently based on their words, descriptions, clues, and evidences as detailed throughout the Book of Mormon. And then to overlay that template on the archaeological record of the ancient inhabitants of North America, mainly the Adena and Hopewell cultures, to see if and how it lines up where it is or is not congruous, and therefore determine if and where civilization, uh, I'm sorry, if and where we see convincing evidence that the Hopewell civilization is a very probable candidate for the Nephites of the Book of Mormon. A fact worth noting is that I have found nothing to date in my research that would preclude the Hopewell from being viable candidates for the Nephites. But interestingly, I cannot say the same for the Mesoamerican setting. In fact, for reasons I have presented before, along with scriptures and evidence I will present today, I can definitively say, without hesitation, that the Greater Nephite Civilization Center could not have, would not have, and did not exist in Mesoamerica. <laughs> how, can I, how can I make such a declaration, some would say? One only needs to look at three simple words found in 37 scriptures in the Book of Mormon. And what are those words? Law of Moses. The Book of Mormon makes it absolutely clear that the Nephite, <clears throat> I'm sorry, makes it ab absolutely clear that the Law of Moses was the foundation for everything the Nephites did on a religious and cultural level. And therefore, a basic understanding of that is essential to have when it comes to knowing how the Law of Moses is our biggest key and most important key to unlocking the mystery of Book of Mormon geography. Unlike 21st century Mormonism, where we need very little to practice our faith, keeping the law of Moses in the strict manner that they did required a very specific group of plants and animals. And in North America, specifically the heartland, the archeological record accounts for every single plant and animal needed to keep the law of Moses. And in fact, an abundance of them. Whereas ancient Mesoamerica provides none of them and could have never supported any group attempting to live the Law of Moses. So put simply, the Law of Moses to which the Nephites adhered too strictly effectively rules out every location in the Western Hemisphere except one, and that is North America. So let's take a few minutes and briefly review some of the pertinent information about the Nephites' Israel, Israelite and ancestry and deep-seated connections to the Law of Moses. If you were here last March or have a copy of uh, my, the DVD I uh, produced from that talk I gave last March, which we just uh, filmed and then made into a DVD, <clears throat> you might recognize a few of the quotes and scriptures I'm going to use today, but I go into a lot more of that on a foundational level in the DVD. Today I'll go, I'll go back and give a quick overview and make sure we have a real good footing on the foundation of what we're going to talk about. So first, we must look to the sacred record itself, where, as I mentioned, we see that in 37 verses, it stated that the Nephites kept, observed, and taught the Law of Moses. Upon hearing that, some would say, ah, but the, the Nephites weren't Jews because the Jews rejected Christ as the Messiah. Yet, we know the Nephites did not reject Christ. They accepted and embraced him as the Messiah and his gospel. Well, at least the righteous ones did. So we must establish that it was, as Jacob explains, the wicked apostate Jews in Jerusalem that rejected Christ and were blinded, making it necessary for Lehi and his family to flee. But as for Lehi and his family and the holy prophets, Jacob tells us, that in, uh, it tells us this in Jacob 4, 4 and 5. He says, For this intent we have written these things, that we may know, I'm sorry, that they may know, talking about us later who receive these words, that they may know that we knew of Christ and we had a hope of his glory many hundred years before his coming. And not only we ourselves had a hope of his glory, but also all of the holy prophets which were before us. He also says this, continuing, 
And for this intent, we keep the law of Moses, it pointing our souls to him, and for this cause, it is sanctified unto us for righteousness. In addition to Jacob's words, let's, let's look to the words of one of our most gifted LDS writers and scholars, John Welsh, the author of this book right here, uh, which was very foundational to all my work. I highly recommend it. It's a farms publication. Uh, John Welch is a prolific writer and researcher for farms, which is now the Maxwell Institute. And I absolutely eat up everything he writes. He's absolutely wonderful. But this is, and his research goes deep into the heart and soul of the Nephite-Israelite connection. Like I said, this book right here is absolutely a must-have when it comes especially to the holy days. But here's what he says. Quote, by suggesting the Nephites, I'm going to give you the quote there, by suggesting the Nephites were true to their word and were strict to observe the law of Moses and its statutes, ordinances, judgments, and commandments, I mean to imply that the Nephites were no more or less Jewish than Jesus himself. And Welch takes it one step farther as he quotes the essence of what Jacob was telling us in the scriptures I just uh, showed you when he declares, this is Welch, Instead of abrogating the Israelite system, the Nephite understanding infused it with joy that brought its commandments more to life. And why is that? Because everything about the law of Moses was designed to bring his people unto him in a close-up and personal way, so they would recognize him when he came as the bridegroom for his bride. So to put it simply, the law of Moses tethered them to their bridegroom in ways that nothing else could have, and therefore, it is for that reason that they delighted in it, as Welch pointed out. <clears throat> now I'd like to jump into our five sets of scriptures that validate the heartland geography. But before we do, I have one caveat. Without fail, every time I present this information, I will have someone come up and say, Lehi, Le Lehi was from the tribe of Manasseh, not Judah, so how can he be considered a Jew? Well, here's what our Book of Mormon scholar, Victor Ludlow, had to say about that. The term Judahites, or Jews, applied specifically to the inhabitants of the southern kingdom of Judah, founded after Solomon's death. Additionally, he said, in the Book of Mormon, Jew can refer to any Israelite, an inhabitant or descendant of the kingdom of Judah. As inhabitants of Judah, Lehi's family were Jews. Okay, so we're all square on that, right? Good. Ah, so then for the record, here's what we know for sure. Lehi and his family, like we said, were Jews who kept the law of Moses, as were their posterity who inhabited the promised land. That is foundation, and everything today will be built upon that, which was incredibly wonderful. The presentation before me, uh, or before lunch, I'm sorry, just laid such great foundation for all this, and I, I absolutely enjoyed it, and it's such a second witness of what I'm talking about. It's wonderful. So as we go forward, I, but before we go forward, I'm gonna present a question that I want you to keep running through your mind as we talk today. And here's the question. If the Lord would lead a group of Jewish families to a promised land of his own making and design, would he not furnish it? with all the plants and animals that are required to live the laws of Moses that he both authored and commanded they keep? Keep that one in your mind. Okay, our first group of scriptures actually has to do with the law of Moses. And there's 40 of them. Like I said, there's the 37 stating they kept the law of Moses, plus three, and there's more than that, but there's three that I'm gonna discuss scriptures showing how they kept the law of Moses, showing them in action. Here are a handful of just the first 37 I was talking about. <clears throat> for example, in Mosiah 25, 15, we read, yea, and they did keep the law of Moses, for it was expedient that they should keep the law of Moses as yet, for it was not all fulfilled. But notwithstanding the law of Moses, they did look forward to the coming of Christ, considering that the law of Moses was a type of his coming, and believing that they must keep those outward performances, that's key, we're gonna talk about those today, the outward performances until the time that he should be revealed unto them. Mosiah 12, 28, and they said, 
we teach the law of Moses. Second Nephi 5.10, and we did observe to keep the judgments and the statutes and the commandments of the Lord in all things according to the law of Moses. <clears throat> okay, so what are the other three about? Well, like I said, they show it in action. They provide a second witness of their claims and demonstrate specific times and places when they were actually performing the outward ordinances. There are a couple more, and here's the main three. First of all, we find that, you know, this meant, I meant to say this is 1 Nephi. This is not 2 Nephi. This is 1 Nephi 2.7, and it's uh, with Lehi, and they had just left, and remember Nephi and the brothers had gone back to get the plates. And it came to pass that he, Lehi, built an altar of stones and made an offering unto the Lord and gave thanks unto the Lord our God. Another key word I want you to look in that scripture is offering. That will be a big part of today as well. All right, that's our first of three that we talk about. Then, um, this is another one. This is, this is Lehi in the wilderness again. Uh, and it came to pass that they did rejoice exceedingly and did offer sacrifice and burnt offerings unto the Lord. And they gave thanks unto the God of Israel. And after I and my brethren had come down unto the tent of my father, they did give thanks unto the Lord their God, and they did offer sacrifice and burnt offerings unto him. So they're doing this all along the route. They haven't even arrived in the promised land. We're, we're, seeing, building, we're seeing Lehi building altars. We're seeing uh, burnt offerings and sacrificing. Okay, that's in, these are all in 1 Nephi. Okay, also, we go to, let's fast forward to King Benjamin's speech many hundreds of years later when uh, they were gathering to hear King Benjamin as he erected his tower, and what was the first thing they did upon gathering? Well, quote, this is Mosiah 2.3, and they also took of the firstlings of their flocks that they might offer sacrifice and burnt offerings according to the law of Moses. So we know for sure it was alive and well at that point, and of course, these sacrifices would be in place until Christ came in 3 Nephi. Okay, and then one more time, just one more of the three. There's more, but these are my three in motion scriptures about the law of Moses. We find this in 3 Nephi 9, 19. And he says this, and he, uh, this is from, from Jesus Christ himself to the Nephites. And ye shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood, yea, your sacrifices and your burnt offerings shall be done away. For I will accept none of your sacrifices and your burnt offerings, implying that until that point, until he said that, that, of course, had continued. Okay, and finally, we have, this is our last one here that I wanna discuss, we have what seems to be a rather obscure reference that can go unnoticed without the right pair of glasses on, and it has to do with Korahor. This is found in Alma 30. Let me give a little bit of background here. The people of Ammon were just recovering from a big battle with the Lamanites, and were mourning their dead and fasting and praying, and were finally experiencing a modicum of peace and uh, in verse three, this tells us kind of what, the, what was going on there, the, the environment, and the, the belief level, the, the commitment level of the people. We see the people did observe to keep the commandments of the Lord, and they were very strict in observing the ordinances of God according to the law of Moses. For they were taught to keep the law of Moses until it should be fulfilled. Well, in comes Korahor, little troublemaker that he was. And of course, he ridicules Christ. He ridicules the atonement and then really goes to town on mocking them for their foolish ordinances of their fathers. Let's see what he says here. Alma versus Korahor, Alma 30, uh, 23. Now the high priest's name was Gedonah, Gedona, not too fluent in my Nephite ease. And Korahor said unto him, because I, do not because I do not teach the foolish traditions of your fathers to bind themselves down under the foolish ordinances and performances which are laid down by ancient priests to usurp power and authority over them, to keep them in ignorance that they may not lift up their heads but be brought down according to thy words. Verse 27, and thus ye lead away this people after the foolish traditions of your fathers and according to your own desires and you keep them down even as it were in bondage that ye may glut yourselves with the labors of their hands, that they durst not look up with boldness and that they durst not enjoy their rights and privileges. Okay, let's do some background here. What, what's, what's going on here? Let's pull out the clues. Korahor was accusing the high priest. Okay, at this point he wasn't talking to Alma. He was talking to the high priest. 
And he wasn't talking to a governor, he wasn't talking to a civil sort of legislature, le legislator. He was accusing the high priest, who was modeled after the ancient priest, of glutting themselves. Okay, again, the, the key word ancient priests. Um, glutting themselves with the labors of the people's hands. What could he mean by that? Remember, like I said, not talking to a king. Um, actually, in Gedona was a righteous high priest. He was the father of Amulek and a direct descendant of Nephi. We learn that in later verses. But anyway, as a righteous priest, a high priest, uh, he was doing no wrong. And we know this, and why do we know this? Don't think of like the priests of King Noah who were doing that and, and, and the wine bibbing and taking the people's money. This is not what was going on here. This was a righteous high priest that was being accused. So righteous was he that Alma, uh, when he finally gets the, the, the showdown with Korahor in a few verses, he defends vehemently this high priest and what this high priest was doing. Okay, so that's what's going on here. And to understand Korahor's, Korahor, excuse me, Korahor's accusation, which sheds incredible light on the Nephites' practice of the law of Moses, we need to view it in the proper context of how the priests operated in their capacity as high priests. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of how the system of sacrifice and burnt offerings worked, as was given to Moses. And you will see that, just as King uh, Korahor implied, the priests did receive a great amount of sustenance in both food and money, according to how the Lord set up the system, which is based on the five Levitical offerings. And here they are. Now, I'm not gonna take the time to go on all the details of, of how and why these are done, although I wish I could. They, they are absolutely beautiful, and, and to do them justice would take a couple of hours at least. I encourage you to look into these five Levitical uh, offerings on your own because they are packed with messianic symbolism. But today I'm just going to give you a feel for how each type of offering was obsten uh, ostensibly enriching the priests, as Korahor claimed. So let's look at these. The first one is the burnt offering. And I'm gonna, you'll see, I'm not going to go through each thing, but you'll see the scripture reference where you can find this. And I'll give you a brief details. It had to be a male animal without blemish that had to be a bull, a lamb, a, a goat, or a dove. Okay, one of those four. And the burnt offering was entirely consumed on the altar, so neither the priest nor the offerer had anything left over. That was the only one that was entirely consumed. That's the burnt offering. Now, the meal offering was different. Sometimes it's called meat offering. Meat, in, in the Old Testament, in King James, uh, is, meant to, uh, is more accurately translated as meat. At that point, was food. So don't think meat as in the meat. We read meat or whatever. It was food. So sometimes you'll see it as meal offering. Sometimes it's meat offering. But for our discussion, we're going to call it the meal offering. Leviticus 2. Uh, it came from finely ground flour from either barley or wheat or parched ears of green corn. There's even some debate on that, that, that the idea is that corn actually meant either uh, barley or wheat. But for this intents and purposes, that's what the, the flour came from. And the, pe the priest would cast a memorial piece. The offerer would come and offer this cake or bread, maybe a pancake-looking thing. It had to be unleavened. He would take off a small piece. He would toss it onto the altar that was constantly burning with fire, and then he could consume the rest of it. And again, realize that the Lord set these up so that the priests, the priests didn't have regular jobs. This is literally how they were to sustain themselves. So there's nothing inherently wrong with this. Korahor has just found a little spin on it to, of course, denigrate it. So that's what's happening with the meal offering. The third offering is the peace offering, Leviticus 7. And again, we have to have either a male or female ox. Pay attention to these animals because you're going to hear them when Nephi tells us what he found. Ox, sheep, goat, plus an unleavened cake. And uh, the fat and entrails were burned, but then all the rest of the animal was eaten by the priest along with the leavened cakes. Okay, so this glutting idea, it can be certainly spun to look like this. We're at the fourth offering now, and it's a sin offering. Leviticus 4 through 8. Depending on the class of people, if it was a priest who was needing a sin offering to be done, he would have to have a bull. The rest would be a goat, a lamb, a dove, or if you're very poor, it could be grain. Once the fat and entrails were burned, all the rest was eaten by the priest. And finally, this one's a little bit different. This is the fifth one, and this is the trespass offering. This comes out of Leviticus 5, 6, and 7. It had to be a ram. And interestingly, what it is was it was a, if you financially frauded somebody or something to do with 
taking money or, or you know, having that kind of a, a situation with a neighbor. The full restitution was to be made to that person plus an extra 20%, plus the ram that was gonna be eaten by the priest, and then 20% to the priest as well, okay? Now, if the fence was against the holy things of God, if somehow you defrauded you know, a, a priest or something to do with the church, then you would have to make the restitution to the priest plus the extra 20%. So there's a lot of money and, and animals and food changing hands here. <clears throat> okay. And like I said, let me back up. There could be a strong case made for the priests who were indeed glutting themselves on the labor of the people, but only by those such as Korahor who are wicked and viewed these sacred rituals set up by God in a very limited secular perspective. To understand what was really going on obviously requires a spiritual maturity that Korahor lacked. But either way, we know it was ordained and sanctified by the Lord both in the old world and here in the new world where Alma vehemently defends it here in his great showdown with Korahor. Now, you may be wondering just what or how in the world, knowing about Korahor and the five Levitical offerings, how that possibly validates the heartland model. Well, the answer to that is found in the following seven slides, which happen to make up our second group of scriptures. And here they are. Okay, if you've seen my presentation before, I hope those look familiar, they should. Not only are they endemic to the holy days and all that was required to practice and observe the holy days as strictly as, they, as we know that they did, and we know they did again because of, oh, I had my book, uh, Welch's work on the holy days and the, and the festivals with the Nephites. So we know they kept the holy days as well. Now, <clears throat> So these animals should look familiar. I just described how each of them were used in one or more of the five Levitical offerings that Korahor was disparaging, demonstrating that to be performing those ordinances, the Nephites would need to have those seven animals, well, there's five plus the two grains, close by, and they would need to have them in great abundance. Furthermore, you, rem you might remember that each one of those plants and animals you just saw were also required, like I said, for the seven holy days and feasts. Now, brothers and sisters, those seven slides you just saw are the proverbial smoking gun for determining that North America was indeed the promised land and Mesoamerica, Mesoamerica was not. And how so? Well, let's look at our second group of scriptures to answer that. And here they are. Uh, it, our second group will be made up of scriptures that have direct linking <coughs> or correlation or connection to those animals. And here are the scriptures that we are going to use. <clears throat> Mosiah 9.9, 1 9, Nephi 18.25, and 3 Nephi 4.7. There's more, but again, for the sake of this presentation, I'm just going to give you uh, three or four with each one. Okay. <clears throat> Let's now look at 1 Nephi 18.25. And here's what he tells us. And we did find upon the land of promise beasts of the forests of every kind, both the cow and the ox and the ass and the horse and the goat and the wild goat and all manner of wild animals which were for the use of men and we did find all manner of ore, gold, silver, and copper. Now you've heard Wayne and, and Rod talk about the metals and huh, that's a whole story in and of itself. It's amazing. But let's look at the animals. Okay. Huh. Weren't these the exact animals that were required by the law? The only one missing is sheep, which is to clarify or which is actually the most important one. And as you know, a sheep is basically, there's the lamb, as is, ba is a sh baby sheep, and a lamb turns into a sheep, and then of course a male sheep grows horns and becomes a ram, and then a female is the ewe. But anyway, so sheep covers lambs, sheep, and rams, that term. So were lambs and sheep, were they found among the Nephites? Well, in third Nephi, we know they are. We hear this, this is a Mormon, Okay, this is Mormon talking now. He's the writer of this, talking about the Gadiantans, right as they were preparing to come to war against Laconius and his people. And he said, and they had a lambskin about their loins, and they were dyed in blood. Okay, owing to the immense number of Gadiantan robbers being in the tens and tens of thousands, as we learn in a few verses later, and each of them be cut, being covered in a lambskin, and I'm guessing they would, might need 
more than one, depending on, I guess, their size, but I haven't made any loincloths lately. But, <laughs> you know, I don't know how, how much they cover. I'll take three yards of lamb, please. Um, anyway, Halloween's coming. I, I guess I got costume on the brain. Okay, so uh, ro- the Gadiantans being so, so numerous, and each of them covering in lamb skin, lamb, lamb skin, it's safe to say that they were found in abundance. Okay. Let's go to the grains, okay? Nephi, meant, or uh, Love Moses, as I talked about, mentions these grains. Not just any grains. Barley, wheat, and corn. All right. What do we learn in Mosiah 9.9? <laughs> and we begin to till the ground, yea, even with all manner of seeds, with seeds of corn, and of wheat, and of barley. And with Neas and with Shem, don't know on those, and with seeds of all manner of fruits, and we begin to multiply and prosper in the land. Isn't that significant or curious that Nephi would specifically list out the grains? He doesn't necessarily list the fruits, but he lists the grains and he lists these animals and it's those exact animals and grains that verify what he's saying about them keeping the law of Moses. We can't ignore that, okay? All right, so now let's see what's next here. Here's the problem and herein lies the rub with Mesoamerica because let's take that information we've just gleaned and compare it with the archaeological records of North America and Mesoamerica. For the Mesoamerican proponents, the issue, let me back up a little bit, I wanna get ahead of myself. For the issue, uh, for the Mesoamerican proponents, the issue of the animals has been a thorn in their side. Perhaps the biggest one of all. Because none of the animals I just listed show up in in their archaeological record, not one. And they know this is a huge problem but they have chosen to brush it away with statements, such as this one I'm gonna show you from John Sorensen, who has been the biggest proponent of the Mesoamerican model. And here's what he says. The terms cattle, horses, sheep, and so on are mentioned several, at several points in the Nephite record. Yeah, they are. And it is dismaying to some who wish to be dismayed. I'm wishing to be dismayed. Can I make that known? Thank you. <laughs> yes, who's dismayed here, please? Um, It is dismaying to some who wish to be dismayed, who honestly wish an answer could be provided why there are no cows like we mean cows, horses like we mean horses, sheep like we mean sheep. The fact is that all the ancient studies say those animals simply were not present in the New World, Mesoamerica, period. They were not here. Okay, yeah, wrong. Okay, Um, first of all, I like how we, does this overarching sort of broad brush, we mean sheep. Last I checked, we didn't translate the Book of Mormon. Last I checked, Joseph Smith did. There was no we involved. So if he wrote sheep and lambs and horses, yeah, I'm pretty sure he meant that. But let's go with it. So it doesn't end here because he knew he had to address the glaring hole in his model. So what did he do? He improvised. He uh, created a list of substitutes for each animal that was on Nephi's list and called it his, quote, candidate animal on the scene list. And here it is. It's in page. You can look in his book. I have his book. Um, He's done some great work. He's just really, really wrong here. And this is page 299. And kind of by being wrong here, it has to kind of throw some doubt on. Okay, anyway, let's not go there. All right, so here we are. Here is his list. And I think it's fascinating, um, you know, with the elephants and curalams and cumons, you know, cumons, I guess is how you say it. You know, of course, we, you look in Rod's books and Wayne's information and all their stuff. We've seen that evidence in North America. But here we get down to some interesting ones. Okay, so the ox, as you know, is a, is a cow. Is, uh, and we have a, ta- a tapir or a bison. Um, this is the one I really like. <laughs> For sheep, we have what's called a paca or a agouti. Okay. Now, my first question is, is well, wait a minute. Who, who, who authorized them to use substitutes, for one? And number two, are we questioning the record? And number three, and this is the big one, does God allow substitutes? I guess I wasn't there in gospel doctrine the day that substitutes and <laughs> improvisation, improvisations were allowed and, you know, whatever you got. So here's we go. 
which I decided to do some looking. So remember where it said sheep, agouti, or paca? Well, here you go. It's a 12 to 20 pound, basically a rat. They call it the royal rat, though, because the Mayan kings grew it for a meat delicacy. Uh, and then it was served to Queen Elizabeth when she went there. So, yeah, we've got a 12 to 20 pound rat there. That's a paca. And remember the other thing he suggested as a candidate animal for a sheep was an agouti? Let's look at that one. Okay, yeah, it's only eight pounds, a little bit smaller, but it's the relative of a guinea pig. So just picture an eight pound guinea pig about the size of a human baby. Yeah, <laughs> charming, isn't it? Okay, um, here's the problem, folks. Um, yeah, you know what? <laughs> Let's just start with the fact that not only would they not have eaten them, but they wouldn't touch them. They are absolutely forbidden, given right to Moses from God himself on what is forbidden in the uh, Jewish dietary code. So, yeah, okay. That, that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Uh, it, always, it still makes me mad, though. I, I've got to get through it. Okay. Again, are substitutes allowed when the correct animals are not found? Yeah, no. Since presenting this the last time, I have learned that substitutes, especially really ugly rodent unclean ones, are so offensive and unacceptable to the Lord that he instructs the people to forego the, or the uh, sacrifice uh, rather than offer a substitute in the instances that they cannot find the adequate or the prescribed item or plant. But to insist on a Mesoamerican setting for the Book of Mormon, it would require unclean substitutes for every single needed plant and animal every single day for 600 years. Yeah, I don't think so. However, when we move them up to North America, guess what? We find every single one accounted for in the archaeological record. So let me go through them for you. First of all, we've got goats. They are indigenous, indigenous to North America. They don't know how long they've been here. They just know they've always been here. That, that is shown in the archaeological record. And furthermore, we get a second witness here. This is in, the, uh, this is in Hopewell Cultural National Historic Park in Chillicothe, Ohio, in a museum. And it is a copper replica of a mountain goat horn. Obviously, they were very aware of mountain go goats, enough to be able to copy uh, their horns with copper. Okay, next. Ah, immense hordes of wild bulls and cows. Wild cows were present in the area upon European contact. We get that from E.B. Callahan's documentary History of the State of New York, volume four, page four. Also in his book, we read of the explorer Champlain's adventures into the Finger Lakes region of New York, where he says that, quote, we saw in diverse quarters immense herds of wild bulls and cows, their horns resembling in some respect the antlers of a stag. At the side of the rapids, we perceived a herd of wild cows which were passing at their ease in great state. Five or 600 are seen sometimes in these regions in one drove. Okay, barley, I mentioned barley. We know we have to have barley. Barley was very uh, germane to um, the, the holy days we talked about, and we'll talk more about that, but it was absolutely essential. And barley was raised by the hope well, and how do we know? This is dark, so I'll read it to you. In uh, Fort Ancient State Memorial Museum in Oregonia, Ohio, we have this placard sitting there in the museum that says, uh, barley was a prominent co crop among the hope well in Illinois and was harvested in the spring. Okay, next. We have wheat. Now, wheat was found in abundance by the Norse when they arrived around 1000 AD in North America. And they talk about it in Nor the Norse discovery of America in the book and uh, in other, uh, other, other writings. But the point is, is that wheat was found in abundance in North America. And finally, lambs and sheep. And of course, here's, here's our ram. But let's... Just, talk about lambs and sheep and rams. In the archaeology, um, sorry, in the archaeology 
of New York State. I'm sorry, I need to go forward, not backward. There we go. In the Archaeology of New York State, uh, page 242 and 243, we find that the remains of domesticated sheep were found in Kip Island in western New York, dated to 100 AD, and this was written by William A. Ritchie, an incredibly well-known and credentialed archaeologist, and he says, remains of a young domestic sheep were recovered from the topsoil. Okay, that speaks volumes. Okay, domesticated sheep. Now that's going to cover our lambs. Okay, of course, our sheep and our rams. So that's big. And then lastly, if you remember in the, some of those five offerings, and it was usually with the poorer class, in fact, this happened with Mary and Joseph, that if they could not afford ox, sheep, cow, or bull, they could then bring a, morning, a turtle dove. Well, another name for a turtle dove is the morning dove, and these are indigenous to the continental U.S., always have been. So here we have them, all covered, all here, all accounted for in one place, and one place only, and that is in North America. Okay, now, speaking of lambs, that will make up our third group, our third group of scriptures, and this is our largest group. And why? Because the word lamb appears in the Book of Mormon a total of 77 times in 66 scriptures. Based on what we just covered uh, regarding the total absence of any lambs in Mesoamerica, thanks to Brother Sorensen letting us know that, the sheer number of times it shows up in the Book of Mormon presents a real enigma that I would like to briefly discuss. Of those 78 references to the lamb, the bulk of them do occur in Nephite's visitation from the animal or from the angel in 1 Nephi. And Nephi, being raised around sheep and lambs, would immediately assimilate such a reference, especially considering his Israelite heritage. But consider this. The rest of the references to the lamb are peppered all throughout the text, from Alma in 82 BC, all the way through Moroni's writings around 400 AD. Mormon invokes the reference three times. Once when he, of course, describes the lambskins of the Gadiatans, and twice when he relates the story of how the three Nephites were cast into a den of wild beasts and uh, yet received no harm because they were spared. In fact, this is how he describes them. They were cast into a den of wild beasts, and behold, they did play with the beasts as a child with a suckling lamb and received no harm. So it becomes very clear that Mormon was all too aware of, one, what a lamb was, two, what it looked like, and three, even its playful and vulnerable nature, to make such a fitting uh, you know, analogy there. And therein lies the rub. To insist that Mormon lived in Mesoamerica in 400 AD creates a huge disparity between the sacred text and the archaeological record. They are in direct contradiction to each other. He simply could not have lived there. And why? Because he would have never seen one single suckling lamb he would have no idea what it was or what it would have looked like or been able to say what their, what, that the Gadiantans had lambskins on their loins. So if we need to force Mormon into a Mesoamerican, Mesoamerican setting, then we must look askance at Joseph Smith. Surely he erred in translation. Obviously he had, no, he had to mean a different word other than lamb. Was Joseph wrong? But when we move Mormon up into North America, we can with full certainty say that flocks of domesticated sheep were found living there, hence it would be a perfectly natural analogy for a Mormon to use. As for the other references, Moroni uses the term Lamb of God and blood of the Lamb, which is very important, blood of the Lamb five times in his writings. Alma uses it twice, and when talking to the great multitudes in Gideon, Amulek uses it as well. Okay, and so... Here we have it, Amulek, or Alma saying, washed white in the blood of the lamb, have faith on the lamb of God. And then their garments, talking about the righteous, should be made white through the lamb of God, or for the, I'm sorry, through the blood of the lamb. And the interesting thing, um, did I get ahead of myself? Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, like I said, the interesting thing is that Alma, Amulek, and Moroni only use it in one of those two ways, either as Faith, in the, faith on the Lamb of God or being washed by the blood of the Lamb. 
washed white by the blood of the lamb. Only in those two ways, not in any kind of practical, you know, uh, tangible way like, say, Mormon did. They use it very spiritually, uh, symbolically. Okay, so uh, Alma, standing in the midst of a great multitude at the city Gideon, Gideon, prophesied of the coming birth of Jesus Christ and implored the people to repent and to have faith, like I said, on, to have faith on the Lamb of God. A significant and honorary title of respect chosen by Alma. And like I said, Alma then bears powerful testimony to the multitude that had gathered, let me back up here, uh, uh, gathered for the Zeezrom showdown between Amulek and Zeezrom. And uh, he said that the righteous will sit down in the kingdom of God because their garments will be made white through the blood of the lamb. A curious choice of words describing the process for attaining celestial glory, don't you think? And it wasn't just Amulek. As I said, Alma and then Moroni also, both pick the exact same verbiage to describe the path to gain exaltation, and that is to be made white in the blood of the lamb. Six powerful and loaded words. Through the blood of the lamb. That is the chosen phrase, one that describes the most important and prescient process in all of the universe, a reference to a lamb and its blood. I suggest the reason for that could very well be that the concept of blood and lambs was very familiar to them and would therefore have the most visceral impact. Think about it. These people who were being addressed by Alma were, quote, just as Jewish as Jesus himself, which means they, as Israelites, observed all the holy feasts, we talked about that, that are in the law of Moses, which include Passover. In fact, they start with Passover. I go into more depth about Passover in my Holy Days presentation, but suffice it to say, as practicing Jews, they would have all had an intimate knowledge of the events of the yearly Passover, which involved bringing a pure white lamb, uh, without blemish into their homes on the 10th of Nisan, caring for it and expecting, inspecting it for four days, which no doubt fostered a type of bonding uh, and, a, and a type of love with that fleecy little creature bounding around their houses. And then at 3 p.m. on the 14th day, they were to present it to the priest at the temple. An interesting detail about this process I want to share that suggests a beautiful sense of God's grace to us is to understand that the role of the priest at Passover was to act as the eyes of God. He was to inspect the perfection of the lamb. So he takes this little guy and he gets down, puts him down and he gets down on his knees and he takes as long as needed to pour over every inch of the lamb to make sure that there is not a single spot or blemish anywhere on that lamb had to be absolutely perfect and perfectly white. The grace is found in that never once does the priest cast a glance of scrutiny or inspection on the offerer to ascertain his imperfections, blemishes, and spots. It is merely a foregone conclusion that the offer is blemished with sin and weakness and is lovingly received and accepted by the priest as such just as he is. In other words, the cleansing he will receive through the blood of the lamb is not dependent upon the offerer being clean, worthy, or suitable. It's just the opposite. The process requires that only the lamb who atones is perfect. As long as those conditions are met in that the lamb is perfect, The offerer then lays his hands on the sweet little lamb, transfers his sins onto the lamb, and then quickly slits its throat. Watching as the blood drip down its neck in great rivulets. Did you know that a lamb is the only animal that doesn't resist its own death? And that it's common for the, sorry, It's common for that sweet little lamb to turn in the in the last fleeting moments of its life and lick the blood off the hands of who of him who just slaughtered it as if to say it's okay I forgive you 
The lamb was then tied to a stick and without breaking a bone, was roasted in an upright position and then consumed that Passover night with bitter herbs, bitter herbs and unleavened bread. As the father sat at the table and recounted the story of his children, of how the destroying angel had passed over the children of Israel and Jehovah had delivered them from the bonds of slavery. Passover is replete with messianic themes, but at the center of it all is that the life of a pure white, unblemished, and entirely innocent lamb is sacrificed that the children of Israel could live for another year. Therefore, is it any wonder that being cleansed by the blood of the lamb is the description of choice for repentance and rebirth in Alma's great sermon and in Amulek's and Moroni's as well? Could anything be more apropos? But only if the people that Alma and Amulek and the rest of the prophets were speaking to had experienced what a lamb was all about. People who had actually held a newborn lamb in their arms and then had spent the next year caring for it as it grew, watched it grazed in the meadows and pranced through their yards, only to have to watch it surrender its life the following spring through no fault of its own. Only those people could be moved to have faith on the Lamb of God. And ultimately, only those people could truly grasp what it meant to be made white in the blood of the Lamb. And that is why I believe Alma, Amulek, and the rest chose those words. But knowing that is true, <laughs> we once again see that the same le- a dilemma of disparity between the Book of Mormon and the archaeological record that I mentioned earlier with Mormon pops up. The disparity is there between the Mesoamerican archaeological record and what I just told you. And therefore, to insist that all of this takes place in a, lamb, in a land where nobody had ever laid eyes on a lamb is quite frankly ludicrous. And in fact, I would almost call it blasphemous. Not only had a single Mesoamerican inhabitant never laid eyes on a lamb, but worse, they never would have held one, cuddled one, played with one, or cared for one, and ultimately never would have sacrificed one, rendering Alma's great discourse utterly confusing and, ha- and without the slightest bit of meaning. But, Move those Nephites up north where the archaeological record assures us that the Nephites knew, raised, and treasured their lambs just like the Book of Mormon says they did. And now we can see that a sacred reference to the blood of lamb would be powerful and personal and deeply impactful. I guess Joseph, being a gifted translator, meant lamb like we mean lamb after all. (laughs) Thank you. I, I, need, I need tissue. <laughs> Before we move on to our fourth group of scriptures, I want to ask a rhetorical question. Don't answer this. Don't you think it's interesting on a symbolic level that for the Mesoamerican model to work, they must dismiss, explain away, offer, substitute rodents for, and ultimately completely regard the lamb? Thank you. They must dismiss, explain away, offer substitute rodents for, and ultimately completely disregard the lamb and all that the lamb signifies and consequently consequently, who the lamb testifies of. I find that interesting. Moving on, here's our fourth group of slides and it has to do with altars. When the Lord laid out to Moses that the tenets of the Mosaic law, when he laid out to Moses the tenets of the Mosaic law, he had to do it in great detail so as to set them apart from the other people that were living around there, and he did that to set them apart in a myriad of ways. 
and means. And one of those was in the building of altars. Let's turn to the book of Deuteronomy 27. Here's our scriptures that go with it. Deuteronomy 27, 4, 5, and 6. And then, of course, we have Exodus 20, 25. And here's what we learn in Deuteronomy uh, 5. Make sure here. I'm sorry, it's Deuteronomy, yeah, 27, 5. Here it is. And there shalt, and there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift upon any iron tool upon them. Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. Let's go to Exodus. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stones, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. Hewn means cut, carved. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Now, remember, Wayne May uh, has talked about some things I want to point out here too, but let me show you first uh, the altars. Uh, this is a t kind of showing a side-by-side. -side. This would be a typical Israelite altar, and it's showing how it was made of big rocks, little rocks, but the important part to notice is there's no carved, cut, engraved stone. Just pure, raw, whole stones. And then we see this little phenomenon going on right here, <laughs> which we'll talk about. And then this is just a juxtaposition of the two of what a Canaanite or a pagan altar would look like. Um, and here they have these nice, well-cut, carved steps, and then these well-carved granite, or, uh, you know, it could be many things, but that is to show the difference. Okay. And they, let me back up here. Too. These are what would be called, there's two types of altars. This is what's called a lay altar. This is what Lehi, uh, Abraham, Jacob would have built. Um, of course, we know the temple altars are different, and we'll talk about that. Okay. So again, this is something like Nephi would have, or I'm sorry, Lehi would have built. Okay, so again, notice that ramp there. And this comes from Wayne. He's done it in his presentations. It's fabulous. Um, Neither shalt thou go up. This is the next uh, scripture in Deuteronomy 27. And we have 4, 5, and this is 6. And it says, oh, I'm sorry, this is Exodus 20, 26. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Now, when you've seen, Wayne, when you've seen Wayne's presentations, he has those uh, very rectangular, perfect, what we consider, he considers, and I do, temple plots where a temple could have been. This is all in Hopewell country. He's found several of them, probably at least half a dozen. And, and I've seen him in his magazine and on his slides. And you remember the, the ramps. There's always four, sometimes two, ramps leading up to this place, well, that's our, that's our scripture. Here's another uh, altar here. Just a, again, a typical, this is an authentic one we find in Israel. Um, all uncut, carved, or uncarved stones there. Um, Saul built altars as well. And again, remember the altars, these lay altars were built mainly before the temple. And we'll talk about that. And then there was this rule called the three day rule. If you found yourself, once the temple was built, if you found yourself three days out from a temple, from the temple, then you could build your own. Hence, we see why Lehi had the authority to build the altar he did. Had he been within three days of Jerusalem, he technically couldn't have. You're to go to the temple and not have your own, but because he was farther out, he could. Okay. And this is where we find Lehi. Uh, it came to pass that he built an altar of stones and made an offering unto the Lord and gave thanks unto the Lord our God. So here's what it could look like. Okay. Then I want to show you um, temple altars. Okay, this is of course just a rendering, but you'll see the, you see the ramp here, um, right here. And um, for the temple altars, the Lord gave a very different set of instructions because they were to be permanent fixtures in the temple and were to be made of wood and then overlaid, uh, overlaid with either brass or wood, or I'm sorry, brass or gold, because there was two altars, so one or the other. But still, even with temple altars, no uncut stone either. Here's the uh, temple or the altar of, of rendering of what it would look like with the tabernacle. Again, we have this little altar of st or a ramp of stones leading up to it. Okay, so the bottom line is this. When it comes to Israelite altars, ca cut or carved stone was absolutely forbidden. The question then is this. How does this line up with the archaeological records of North America and Mesoamerica? Just one more while I talk here. 
Can we look at the altars of both places for discernible evidence of an Israelite culture? Well, yes, we can. And I want to show you one more. Uh, this is the one that was overlaid of gold. This one was uh, the altar of incense. This one was what, what was just right outside the Holy of Holies, and only the priest could approach that one. The bigger one I showed you that was in pencil, um, that's what the people could come to and bring their, their offerings. And that one was brass. It was called a brazen altar. This one was made of or overlaid with gold. But again, these were within the temple. And of course, the Lord would have those be very decorative, very beautiful, you know, because they served a, a different purpose for the temple. Okay, so they didn't serve a diff different purpose, but they were made for different reasons. Um, and beauty and exquisite design was the order of the day for the temples, as we know. Okay, so we're gonna talk more about altars in North America. And I had to show this. This is an ode to Wayne. Um, because he supplied me with all these pictures I'm gonna show you here, and I wanted to just show you him standing there by an Ojibwa altar. So let me go through some of these here for you. This comes from the, from the temple uh, site in Clinch River, where they had found a, uh, they call it an Egyptian temple in Tennessee, basically, you know, a, 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 an Israelite temple that um, matches up with Solomon's. Um, stones are spread across the floor, believed to be a collapsed altar, knocked over before being buried with earth. So you see all those stones in there? That was believed to have been a stone altar, not hewn stone, not cut stone. Here is in eastern Pennsylvania, an ancient altar, unknown builder, possibly Delaware. There's a, a, a ceremonial stone right there, and then this big altar here made of just, as you can see, cut, uncut, unhewn stone natural raw uh, whole stones. Okay, um, <clears throat> this is interesting. He sent me this one. Many clay and brick altars have been found at the bottoms of Hopewell burial mounds. And uh, you think, okay, so clay and brick, is that, how does that jibe with the, with the you know, law of Moses? Well, in Deuteronomy 27.5, the Lord commands the children of Israel to build an altar of stones once they cross the Jordan, and he's, he wanted them to build an altar of stones and then plaster it with plaster. Well, when you look at plaster, here, you see this down here, you see it's um, clay. Uh, water, sand, mud, sometimes straw. So clay being earthen, because the point with the Lord's altars is he wanted to be made of earthen, organic things. So, and earthen is the word he uses as well. So here this qualifies because this is, uh, it looks to be like clay bricks or some kind of clay. It's not cut. Let's see, moving on. Again, this is that Ojibwa altar you see that I showed you earlier. Again, natural whole stones. This was uh, in an Iowa altar in the Davenport mine, and you can see they've just drawn it, but it was covered up, but that's what it originally looked like. And again, this is uh, in Adam on Diamond. This was actually stones from Adam's altar. We know that from Joseph Smith. It's, these are all gone now, but at one time the altar had been um, deconstructed and it was just lying here like this, but of course, again, whole stones. Now this is interesting, and hopefully we'll have time to talk about the, the serpent a little bit. Um, the, uh, this is the serpent mound. Now it's hard to see because you're just seeing the very the oval just there at the end. But <laughs> this is a rare photo Wayne was able to find just recently, taken by Putnam, I believe, and one of the early explorers and discoverers of the serpent mound. And um, it's, of course, gone now, but right there in the middle is what? It's an altar of un cut stones, and right here, and it's not there anymore either, but if, you, if you're with Wayne at the Serpent Mound, he'll walk you down to the bottom, and you can see where it's been pushed off, a big that, that ledge right there, and it's still there. I've seen this big pillar. It's about 10 feet tall, it's amazing. And then, of course, this altar is gone, but it is a natural stone altar. I was thrilled when Wayne sent me this, it was so nice. Well, let's look at what is going on here, or a parallel, and you can't, I couldn't help but miss it. Um, a uh, curious parallel between what you, were, what you saw at the serpent and what happened at Bethel when Jacob was commanded to go there and build an altar of stones, much like you know, the ones we saw. And so he did. And then, as we all know, the Lord came to him and, among other things, changed his name to Israel. It would become known as one of the great theophanies experienced by the early patriarchs. Afterwards, the Lord instructed Jacob to then put up a pillar of stone near the altar and anoint it with oil and with a drink offering. We'll talk more about a drink offering in our next group of scriptures. So in examining this photo of how the serpent mound originally appeared, I can't help but see some undeniable likenesses, especially considering how sacred and revered by all the people, 
all the native tribes, that the Serpent Mountain has been so revered, suggesting to me that it could very possibly be a plausible location for an earth-shaking theophany, much like Jacob's. Now, before we move on to Mesoamerican altars, I want to point out that in the many discussions I've had with Wayne May, who's been in the field up here in North America, trapping through these woods, examining these altars, mounds, and structures of the Hopewell in Adena for, what, 30 years, um, he has informed me that, I hope I'm saying this right, correct me if I'm wrong, that he himself hasn't coved, come on a, across a carved altar of hewn stone in that time that it's the, that's the ones we saw. So, now let's take a close look at the altars found in Mesoamerica. Are they consistent with an Israelite civilization? Do they adhere to the Lord's instructions given to Moses? To answer that, let's turn to Julia Guernsey. She's the author of this book called Ritual and Power in Stone, an associate professor from the University of Texas. She has spent years in Mesoamerica researching and photographing the incredible stone structures of the region, including and especially the altars. I was so intrigued with her work that I contacted her and began to exchange emails with her so I could ask her some specific and clarifying questions about her work in which she documents that all altars found in Mesoamerica are carved in stone in some way or another, and most with amazingly and strikingly ornate details in various themes, animals being the most common. And I'll show you some, but let's talk about what area she, she specialized in. You might recognize this of, you know, what they might call the narrow neck of land. This is the Mesoamerica, so you've got central Mexico here and, and Guata, uh, Guatemala. But this area right here, which is where the most Mesoamerican scholars uh, purport the, the area of the Nephites to be, is called Izapa, this whole area right here. Anyway, and she actually specialized in that area and that's where her studies were from, and she specialized in, in the time of the late pre-classic period, which is 300 BC to 250 AD, prime Nephite time. Okay, and so that, that was her specialty, and she has no affiliation with the church or farms or anything, of course, but um, in her book, this is just a drawing, because it's hard to, to take a photo sometimes of carved things, it's hard to see the, without the, that relief, but anyway, so this is a drawing of kind of what a typical altar looks like down there. Um, you can see it's, it's, a, it's a jaguar mouth opening. Jaguars was one of their, their uh, the underlords, or their, their gods, and then usually they're, they're representing deity and sort of this homage to their lords, their gods, um, and they have many. And uh, so this was, this was uh, just a typical altar she has included there. Uh, like I said, many times the altars had themes, and I don't want you to picture all, these, all of them being sacrificial altars. They weren't. Of course, there were some. But like, for example, these. This was a big feline altar. You can't tell, but it's absolutely huge. This is a toad altar. These are in the, the museums down there. And these are from Izapa, that area I was talking about. Anyway, what she said um, were that for the most part, they're placed in these big open ceremonial plazas. Some were used for decoration. Some were actually sat on, like kind of like... Um, the royalty could sit on them, but of course many, like I said, were used for a ritual sacrifice. But again, the main point being that regardless of what their specific use was, they were all stone and were all altered or cut in some way. Even the plain oblong ones had been shaped by an iron tool or tools. In one of my emails, I actually asked her if any, if any time during her many travels and years that she spent down there, did she find any altars anywhere that were made of piled up natural stone. And she said, no, never. I said, never, you never saw one. You never saw one on a mountain or by itself. Or, no, never. Any altars, these are her words, any altars I ever studied and found, and there were thousands, were cut, carved, or shaped in some way. Okay, let me go back, and we're almost to our fifth group here. Uh, kind of along the lines with my question that I started with, and I will continue, but would an Israelite people have lived in Mesoamerica seeing these altars? Where the foremost expert on the subject never saw one, a single Israelite-type altar of natural uncut uh, stones carved of the thousands that she saw? Or would it have been much more likely they lived in North America where we have just the opposite altar, the perfect altar for the law of Moses that would adhere to it so well, so perfectly, and we find them all over. Um, so that is something for you to consider. And finally, we arrive at our fifth group of scriptures, and this theme for our last group here is wine, vines, and vineyards. 